A million girls would kill for this job. Emily Charlton of The Devil Wears Prada is the textbook image of the workaholic. She lives at the office and expects others to do the same. You are chained to that desk. She cares about nothing more than pleasing her boss. And we have to make sure that they all think that she knows exactly who they are. And I've been studying for weeks. On one level, she's a product of the fashion industry, embodying its most toxic, destructive standards. I'm just one stomach flew away from my gold weight. But back in 2006, she also reflected a more general trend that we've seen explode in the years since the movie. Modern American culture has a love affair with working yourself to the bone. Where have you been? Sleeping. <laughs> what? All night? Emily encapsulates the valor and virtue we attach to constantly being busy and overstretched. And her story reveals the dark side of living to work. Emily's devotion to her job literally starves her and nearly kills her. You might say Emily's cautionary tale prefigured today's Thank God It's Monday culture. We have medium speed Wi-Fi, draft beer on tap. For okay, what? Girl, I hope I get to work here. So to better understand the Emilys of our times, we're taking a deep look at the history of workaholism in cinema and TV and asking whether it's possible to survive the rat race with your sense of self intact. Thank God it's Friday, right? This video is brought to you by BetterHelp, an online counseling service that you can access anytime, anywhere. When you sign up, you'll be matched with a licensed therapist or counselor you can connect with through phone calls, video conferencing, or text messaging. Just click the link in the description below, betterhelp.com slash the take, to get 10% off BetterHelp today. I'm gonna work until I'm 100 and then cut back to four days a week. Oh God, I'm already so bored thinking about that one day off. The term workaholism dates back to 1971 when it was coined to describe the compulsion or the uncontrollable need to work incessantly. On-screen workaholics cover a range of personalities, but they follow some common patterns. The positive view of the workaholic is someone driven by pure passion. This is gonna be so much fun! Often, they're in a high-powered, high-stakes career, and their exhilarating job is framed as the ultimate adrenaline rush. That was such a high. I don't know why anybody does drugs. The darker interpretation of the workaholic character is someone fueled by cutthroat personal ambition. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. Or who's using their job to fill a deeper emotional void. She's a workaholic works frantically to avoid dealing with her weird mix of lack of self-worth and narcissism. I really like her. Almost universally, the workaholic character neglects their personal life. Hey, don't you people ever sleep? Don't any of you have husbands, wives, and kids lying? No. When you're responsible for serious matters or even people's lives, it's easy to justify your job taking precedence over everything else. This is the most important thing I'll ever do, Jenny. I have to do it well. It's not more important than your marriage. It is more important than my marriage right now. But because they spend all their time at the office, the workaholic struggles to maintain relationships. You can get me a date for tonight. Actually, make that three dates. Who knows when I'm gonna get another night off. Work is their mistress, the lover who always comes first. Why don't you not go to work tomorrow? Take the day off. Me not work? We can see the origins of today's work culture in the second industrial revolution from about 1870 to 1914. With urbanization and the rise of factories, for the first time, people had to organize their workday around hours of work completed rather than sunlight. This led to the question of how long a workday should be and the danger of exploiting workers through excessive hours. Labor unions campaigned for an eight hour workday, which evolved into what we today call a nine to five job. Early 20th century cinema classics like Metropolis and Modern Times reflected fears about industrialization's effects on society and alluded to the risk of turning human beings into uniform cogs in a machine. The Billows feeding machine will eliminate the lunch hour, increase your production, and decrease your overhead. The second half of the 20th century saw the birth of the workplace sitcom. The Guardian's Charles Bromesco argues that from the 70s through the tail end of the 90s, the sitcom's predominant attitude toward the hassles of work was begrudging acceptance. Christmas is just like any other day when you work in a newsroom. You know what I mean? Of 
No. You gotta work on Christmas. I've gotta work on Christmas. The 90s was the slacker era. That's funny because I haven't seen you working for a while. A long while. During this stable, prosperous decade in America, on-screen characters seemed less interested in work than ever. I don't think my boss likes me either. No, I don't think mine likes me either. Maybe it's a universal thing. Yeah, or maybe it's because you're all hanging around here at 11.30 on a Wednesday. Meanwhile, at the movie theater, a narrative emerged of men rebelling against their deadening, soul-crushing office jobs. I don't like my job, and uh, I don't think I'm gonna go anymore. These 90s films captured a resentment over being made a cog in the corporate machine, so you could see them as a spiritual update to those early 20th century films about the drudgery of factory work. Fast forward to now, and you're more likely to see people performing their love of work. To do what you love, and that is just doing what you feel fulfilled by and what drives you. So what happened? In short, the tech industry. New York Times writer Aaron Griffith argues that today's work culture comes from the fact that starting around the new millennium, tech companies began offering perks meant to help companies attract the best talent and keep employees at their desks longer. Google was a little startup just like we are. And when they started bringing in chefs and masseuses, we thought they're nuts. And now they're worth over $400 billion. We can see this practice at play in The Devil Wears Prada, too. Sure, Andy gets to go to Paris Fashion Week, raid the runway closet, and take home whatever expensive products her boss doesn't want for herself. Miranda didn't want it, so... Oh, no, 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 this bag is like $1,900. I cannot take this from you. But in the long run, wouldn't more vacation time or higher pay be worth a lot more? We get emails from you at your office at 2 a.m. Your pay is terrible. According to Griffith, mainstream culture has been shaped by companies like WeWork with its brand of performative workaholism. With WeWork, you should expect a space to make a life, not just a living. Our culture has created a kind of glamour around working constantly. Kirsten keeps a cot in her office. Rick keeps a Tempur-Pedic cot in his office. It's like the Tesla of cots. In 2006, Emily was already completely sold on performative workaholism. I love my job. I love my job. Love my job. She's brainwashing herself into believing she loves her job in order to make it through another punishing day. And that raises the question, if our modern world is full of Emilys, how many of us are doing the same? I already have my dream job. You're on your corporate research <laughs> Oh, you're right, my job sucks. To really understand how Emily builds on the on-screen workaholic trope, we can't overlook that she's a working woman, a subset of the workaholic character who has her own complicated history. Sometimes I get concerned about being a career woman. I get to thinking my job is too important to me. Across movies and TV, we can see three basic working girl character types, though they tend to have some overlap. One. The spunky working everywoman. This character type was most famously embodied by Mary Tyler Moore. Bromesco argues that for Mary, simply existing as a 30 year old single woman in a competitive and male dominated workplace counted as a win. After working here in the newsroom, associate producer, can you believe that? In an era where many women still did not work outside the home, there was a sense of victory in being able to have a career of your own. Miss Olson, you are now a junior copywriter. Is this really happening? Viewers can see themselves in the working every woman character. No lunch, I got speech class. What do you need speech class for? You talk fine. We usually meet her at the beginning of her working life, which helps us connect to her emotionally and feel her ups and downs as our own. She inspires us by representing work as a source of empowerment. You're gonna make it after all. Two. The Career Woman as Cautionary Tale. Unlike with the every woman, we're often introduced to this character when she's well into her career, and her commitment to her job is no longer framed in such a flattering light. It's just because you have no semblance of a life outside of this office, you think that you can treat all of us like your own personal slaves. In fact, we could read this trope as a cultural backlash to the young every woman. This woman is my secretary. This is highlighted in Working Girl, where Tess, a clear example of our first character type, discovers that career woman Catherine is a jaded villain trying to pass off Tess's idea as her own. She rifled through my desk, found my memo outlining a Trask radio acquisition, and has been passing it off as her idea. It was my idea. The career woman is essentially the female version of the workaholic absentee father who doesn't spend time with his family. Peter, yeah. you're missing it. Uh, all right. Want a meeting tomorrow, a.m.? 
Dad, my game. You promised. And she often has to learn to step back from her career and make room for romantic love. I've got a big day. You've always got a big day. Even on the weekends, you have a big day. You can't let this job be your life. This setup makes her a fixture of rom-coms. And three, the boss superwoman. This high-powered woman is killing it at her job, and her drive is portrayed as part of what makes her fabulous. I'm gonna kick some ass and remind them that I'm fierce. This character type took off in the 2000s and is a staple of Shonda Rhimes' shows. It may even borrow from real life, as Rhimes' success has made her into an aspirational figure, much like the women she creates. And she's spoken positively about being a workaholic. I work a lot, very hard, and I love it. When I am hard at work, when I am deep in it, there is no other feeling. It is hitting every high note, it is running a marathon, it is being Beyonce. In part, this character's fabulosity comes from the fact that she makes her own money, which puts her in total control of her own life. You can't afford me. The ladies of Sex and the City prefigured this character type because the show explored the power of financial independence and not needing to rely on a man for economic support. And with that, Ms. Miranda Hobbs Esquire, aka Just Me, bought herself her first apartment and promptly took herself out for a drink. Interestingly, the three main female characters of Devil Wears Prada seem to fit neatly into these categories. Andy is the spunky working girl we root for. Well, look, you gotta start somewhere, right? And Miranda is the cautionary tale who represents the danger of sacrificing your personal life for a career. Just imagine what they're gonna write about me. The dragon lady, career obsessed. And Emily is going for category three, the utterly fabulous existence of the high-powered glamour workaholic. I get to go with her to Paris for Fashion Week in the fall. I get to wear couture, I go to all the shows and all the parties, I meet all of the designers, it's divine. Except that to the outside viewer, Emily's life hardly appears that great. Remember you and I have totally different jobs. I mean, you get coffee. <laughs> and you run errands, yet I'm in charge of her schedule, her appointments, and her expenses. In Emily's eyes, Miranda belongs in Superwoman Category 3, but the movie places her firmly in Villainous Category 2. You chose to get ahead. You want this life? Those choices are necessary. Emily is so enthralled by the myth of Miranda that she looks right past this, and that leaves her aspiring towards an empty ideal. This reflects our contemporary lives, too. A woman, that, that's a minus. Well, of course it's a minus. I didn't make the world. We may be in an era where powerful, hardworking women are lionized on screen, but society itself is not set up to reward female workaholics. Even if a woman is doing extremely well in her career, there's still discomfort around her success. He offered it to me to be next. So because I, I thought that it was something that we wanted for me. Many heterosexual couples are unwilling to reveal when a woman is the breadwinner. And Aliyah Hamid Rao writes for The Atlantic that the more economically dependent men are on their wives, the less housework they do. In other words, women's success in the workplace is penalized at home. So it's clear that our world has a long way to go before category three, the working superwoman, becomes more than a fiction. Emily's devotion to her work rivals religiosity. Our modern-day obsession with work can be traced back to the Calvinist branch of Protestantism. Sociologist Max Weber wrote that because Calvinists believed in predestination, they sought to be successful in order to prove they were part of the elect, destined to go to heaven. Today, it's not hard to see how the Calvinist idea of a calling has evolved into people seeing their careers as representing their life's purpose. I devote myself completely to my job. It's what I do, it's all I am. In a modern spin on the Protestant work ethic, some have argued that work has now effectively replaced religion as the arena where Americans seek meaning in our modern lives. A lot of people have essentially turned to work to find the very things that they used to seek from traditional religions. Transcendence, meaning, community, self-actualization, a totalizing purpose in life. We may be using non-stop work or busyness to fill a deeper existential void. As Tim Kreider writes, obviously your life cannot possibly be silly or trivial or meaningless if you are so busy, completely booked, in demand every hour of the day. I get 20 minutes for lunch and you get 15. Worshiping at the altar of work turns the boss figure into a kind of deity. She saved me. She saved Doc, she saved Quinn, she saved you. Bore on the floor, I really, I feel... Get down! Bore on the floor! Boy, boy, boy. Oh, I got it! No. 
There is perhaps no better encapsulation of the boss god than Emily's worship of Miranda Priestley as an almost mythical superhuman being. She's the editor-in-chief of Runway, not to mention a legend. Many people turn to religion to make sense of the world. But work wasn't designed to do such a thing. As Derek Thompson writes in The Atlantic, the modern labor force evolved to serve the needs of consumers and capitalists, not to satisfy tens of millions of people seeking transcendence at the office. Thus, the root of the problem is that we're told to look for profound meaning in our work in the first place. And the only way to be truly satisfied is to do what you believe is great work. And the only way to do great work is to love what you do. On the surface, this may seem like good advice. One third of your life is spent at work, so ideally that time should be devoted to something you care about and enjoy. But the constant pressure to love your job sets people up to feel crushed when it doesn't unlock a deep sense of fulfillment. So just like Emily, from time to time, many of us could stand to be reminded that a job is just a job. I hope you know that this is a very difficult job, mm -hmm. for which you are totally wrong. And if you mess up, my head is on the chopping block. Emily is a model of what not to do in your career. You may never ask Miranda anything. It's one thing to work all the time because you genuinely love what you do. You're off work, Christina. Go enjoy your day. No, I'll enjoy my day if I can help retrieve a heart, I promise. But Emily never actually seems happy at Runway. So until she decides that you're not a total psycho, I get the lovely task of waiting around for the book. During her time there, she sacrifices her sense of self and self-respect for the job. Under the pressure of her industry, she goes on starvation diets. You look so thin. Do I? Yeah. Oh, it's for Paris. Well, I'm on this new diet. It's very effective. Well, I don't eat anything. And when I feel like I'm about to faint, I eat a cube of cheese. And comes to the office even when she's terribly sick. How's the cold doing? Like death warmed up. She gets hit by a car because she's so distracted running an errand for Miranda showing how her commitment to work is literally putting her life at risk. And if she continues on this road, like many an addict, she will kill herself. This disregard for her own well-being suggests that Emily doesn't really value herself. What took you so long? I have to pee! What? You haven't peed since I left? No, I haven't been manning the desks, haven't I? Bursting. She's internalized the negativity that permeates Runway's workplace culture. It's just Miranda wanted some scarves from Hermes, and she did tell me yesterday, but I forgot like an idiot. And Emily is well on her way to a problem facing many in the overstretched millennial workforce, burnout. BuzzFeed's Anne Helen Peterson named millennials the burnout generation. You deserve paid what? work. I can't what? get paid work. I just graduated from Cornell with a business degree. That's the worst ivy. Thompson argues that this is due to a combination of student debt, entering the workforce post-recession, and the way social media has heightened the pressure to present an image of success to one's peers. Meanwhile, instant communication has made it so there is no clear work-life divide anymore. Andrea, Miranda decided to kill the autumn jacket story for September, and she is pulling up the Sedona shoot from October. You need to come into the office right this second, and you pick up her coffee order on the way. The romance around work strategically glosses over the fact that being a workaholic isn't a choice for most of us. To jobs that pay the rent. To jobs yes. that pay the rent. To jobs that pay the rent. Our country's policies essentially force people to work a lot. We get little vacation time, new parents aren't guaranteed paid leave, our healthcare system makes many people reliant on their jobs for insurance, and even getting welfare assistance usually requires proof of employment. And a study by the Washington Center for Equitable Growth found that because people's output can't always be measured in a concrete way, companies tend to unconsciously use working hours and face time as a way to estimate their employees' productivity and commitment to their jobs. He's in here every night at 9, every morning at 8. But in the long run, workaholism doesn't serve employers well either. People who are overworked are less productive and more likely to make mistakes. Oh my god, I, can't, I just can't remember what his name is. I just I just saw his name this morning on the Oh, I know this. Even if you don't care if the rest of your life falls apart, you still shouldn't be like Emily, because her nonstop work style doesn't help her get ahead. How does Miranda show her appreciation for the way Emily is killing herself for this job? The tales of night. your incompetence do not interest me. She's been at Runway longer than Andy, but the new girl with no experience overtakes her in less than a year to become Miranda's preferred assistant. I need the best possible team with me. That no longer includes Emily. 
After Miranda betrays Emily by choosing Andy to accompany her to Paris, Emily still returns to work for this person who clearly does not value her. By the end, Andy is pursuing her real dream of being a journalist while Emily hasn't moved forward an inch. You have some very large shoes to fill. Hope you know that. Employees need to have boundaries, but Emily doesn't have Andy's instinct to question conventions that seem ridiculous and downright cruel. One time an assistant left the desk because you know, she sliced her hand open with a letter opener and Miranda missed Lagerfeld just before he boarded a 17-hour flight to Australia. She now works at TV Guide. At a certain point, if you want your superior's respect, you need to assert yourself. You're never going to get that corner office until you start treating Don as an equal. As we discussed in our Miranda video, Andy's show of self-respect is what earns her a second look from Miranda in the first place. I'm smart. I learn fast and I will work right, very hard. Meanwhile, Emily's haughtiness towards Andy reveals that she isn't able to see past appearances to the deeper qualities that an employer might value, like having a unique voice and take on the world. I mean, I have no idea why Miranda hired her. <laughs> Career excellence requires other qualities in addition to devotion and long hours. Emily plays too much by the rules. She doesn't invest in other areas of her life. She loses her joy, and most importantly, she doesn't put herself before the job. I refuse to be sick. I'm wearing Valentino for crying out loud. She's so fixated on what's required of her that she's willing to efface her identity. You do not talk to anyone. You do not look at anyone. This is of the utmost importance. You must be invisible. Do you understand? This makes her a good assistant, as that's a role that requires supporting someone else's career. But workaholism alone will not make you the next Miranda Priestley. I love my job. 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 This video is brought to you by BetterHelp. These days, burnout is all too common, but it can be hard to make time to talk it out in a face-to-face -face counseling session. BetterHelp is the answer. They let you receive stellar private online counseling from the comfort of your home. All you have to do is fill out a questionnaire and within 24 hours, you'll be matched with a therapist who fits your specific needs. BetterHelp has counselors who specialize in areas like stress, anxiety, and relationships, so you know you're getting care that's tailor-made for you. We've actually used BetterHelp ourselves, and we love how easy and accessible it is. BetterHelp is also super affordable. It costs only $65 a week, and you may qualify for financial aid. Plus, it's available worldwide. So click the link in the description below, betterhelp.com slash the take, to get 10% off today. Just keep in mind that BetterHelp is not a crisis line. If you need immediate assistance, we'll leave a link to a crisis helpline below.